on the unmute button. Good evening, everybody, and uh, great to see so many familiar faces, although they're very, very small on my screen. Um, and, and always wonderful to, to present with uh, AIA. I, I love getting out and, and doing these with folks. Uh, I hope this particular presentation has some value. Um, I, I would share with you that how this presentation ended up isn't much like it was originally intended. Um, when Nilu and I first started talking about what kind of content to include, you know, four or five months ago, um, we were working on a uh, emergency design task force, which I'll talk a lot about. And the uh, we've had quite a few meetings, but the but the guide hasn't come out yet. That that is the work product for this group. So. Um, being very flexible that we are, this 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 presentation has sort of evolved and changed into some something other than what I started out at. Um, as always, if you have questions or anything, you know, please interrupt, please shout it out because otherwise, you know, I, I've listened to myself talk for an hour at a time and it's it's just not that fun. <laughs> so if you have questions or anything, uh, shout them out, send a, a do a chat, whatever, and we'll we'll. Uh, see if we can answer them. We'll also have an opportunity at the end of the presentation to, to do Q&A about the presentation or anything else that you might have questions about. Um, those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, the, a new executive director at Cedar sinai I retired from Oshpod uh, last year at the, at the very beginning of the year, um, starting a new job I thought was going to be a, a new adventure. And then the pandemic hit and it truly was a new adventure. It was a completely different world. Um, and I told my boss, Zeke Triana, many times, if I'd had known that I was gonna cause this pandemic, I wouldn't have retired. It's been just, it's just been a, an amazing uh, transition at the medical center, and particularly being on, the, on this side of the, of the, of the partnership uh, fence, if you will, the seeing the things that owners uh, and designers have to contend with that I never really had an exposure to when I was with Oshpod uh, has been quite the eye opener. So uh, I hope to be able to share some perspective that I brought from Oshpod along with me, as well as some things that I've learned that are that are new. Um, without further ado, I definitely can't forward. I definitely need to give. Special thanks to Chris Tokas, my good friend, uh, structural engineer, premier at Oshpod. Um, and in this case, he's the principal architect for this particular presentation that he gave me permission to, to modify and share with you. So talking about the emergency design uh, task force, this was, a, this was a group of folks. This was, this was sort of a, a, a an, an outlay of the Hospital Building Safety Board uh, in talking and working with Oshpod to address pandemic uh, things, uh, to address uh, the challenges that hospitals are facing, uh, and to come up with some ideas for you know dealing with these issues in the future. The Hospital Building Safety Board and Oshpod created this this emergency design task force. Um, the members of the Task force include the executive staff at Oshpod and many of the technical uh, leads and specialists at Oshpod, but also includes representatives from, from licensing, from hospitals, uh, design professionals, contractors, IORs, et cetera. It's a good uh, working group, not too big. You know, we wanted to keep it large enough to get plenty of input, but not too big so that we can get stuff done. Um, and the goal of this uh, task force would be to uh, author create a, uh, a guideline for design of healthcare facilities uh, in the future, dealing as they relate to um, what, we, what I want to call all perils. Um, the, the, the task force, or excuse me, the guide uh, is, is a bit of a challenge because there are things that you can do in design of a new building that you obviously can't do in the design of an existing building. And so 
we're sort of trying to tailor the, uh, the guidebook to incorporate both concepts, you know, both ideas and give some, some suggestions and ideas. Um, the, there were six groups that we ultimately settled on to, to focus more, more or less as chapters of this, of this guide. The first group is how to do quick conversion of rooms to negative pressure or areas to negative pressure. Uh, what, how do you do that quickly? What is entailed in that? Um, some of the things that we're looking at are, you know, do I do negative airflow for ORs? There were some facilities that said, you know, we're, we're concerned about infection spreading from uh, operating rooms with patients who are, who are infectious uh, and positive pressure. So maybe we have negative pressure in, in certain ORs. This is, of course is very uh, a dangerous proposition because the negative, uh, the negative pressure relationship is potentially brings in uh, infectious uh, properties to the, to the patient who may suffer from that as well. Um, we are looking at ways to make creating negative pressure rooms or areas a little more flexible, even though this is generally speaking really not easy to achieve. Um, making sure that alarms that measure pressure differentials uh, can be easily switched back to the original state when these temporary negative pressure rooms are created. Uh, and then, of course, speaking to the code requirements and challenges for that. Now, regarding operating rooms and negative airflow, we found that there's really no scientific scientific evidence that that supports the need for negative pressure operating rooms. The doctors and, and nursing staff are already protected in PPE. Everybody, everybody is gowned up, and the likelihood of infection to uh, to the staff is pretty limited. What we have found that is useful is perhaps creating a negative pressure anteroom at the entrance to the OR. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Uh, next group is changing outside air percentages during a wildfire. So again, we talked about this being all perils. This isn't limited just to COVID. Uh, and in California, we have wildfires occasionally. And some of these wildfires uh, affect hospitals. So there's clearly a need to deal with that issue short of uh, evacuating the hospital during these wildfires when the fire may not be directly impacting the facility, but the smoke layer and the, the uh, inversion layers created by the fire really do affect the, the patients. Um, some might think that just turning off the air handling units might be the simplest solution. And maybe sometimes that is, you know, depending on the configuration of the existing air handling system. Um, but no, no air is usually pretty dangerous from a, from a uh, infection control standpoint because these positive and negative pressure relationships are, are very important. Um, there's also some talk about using filters on the outside air rather than eliminating the outside air altogether, you know, keeping the air handling system running but shutting off outside air intakes. Uh, we feel that shutting off outside air intakes temporarily is probably va a valid solution, but some of these fires last you know, weeks or months and keeping outside air turned off to a, to a building can uh, also be problematic. Uh, carbon filters are, are something to consider for final filters. They're, they're much more expensive, but they will filter out these particulates um, that, that we're trying to address with. The next group is how to better expedite emergency projects. Now this is, to me, was a, a kind of a common sense um, task or take on, on take, but turns out that it, it isn't necessarily common sense. How do you better expedite emergency projects? How do you let Oshpod know you need to do this work on an emergency basis? Uh, if you're not familiar with an emergency project, that's work that occurs prior to design. So prior to uh, design, plan, submittal, plan, review, approval, and building permit, this work all gets done. And then the design follows after the fact. 
Ashba does have a policy and a, and a procedure for this, but perhaps the process isn't really well understood. I experienced that firsthand at, at one of our facilities at Marina Del Rey, um, that they did not understand the emergency process and uh, there was a steep learning curve for us there. But things like better communication, you know, communication is key in these things. Communi that, that sounds pretty straightforward, but um, who do you communicate with? If you don't know who you communicate with before the event, you know, during the event is not the time to, to try and figure that out. Uh, access to information, having contact with, with the field staff, uh, et cetera. All these are other bullet points or, or ideas on how to better expedite these projects. The next grouping we have was uh, a group to, to address designing spaces to accommodate multiple beds. This was obviously something that we experienced firsthand in, in hospitals during the pandemic. Uh, so in designing in the future, carrying that forward, taking those lessons learned and actually designing facilities that can facilitate future events to accommodate multiple ped, multiple patients in a bedroom. Things to take into mind are like, you know, plumbing dead ends um, that, that can, that are in non-patient areas, but later become patient areas. Those dead, those plumbing dead ends can have uh, infections or diseases within them. Uh, taking into account the need for redundant outlets in areas where you probably wouldn't anticipate needing them. Um, having splitters available for medical gas outlets. How about providing portable uh, hand wash facilities because the patient rooms require a, a hand wash lavatory in the room, uh, having portable hand wash facilities available for when you need them is, is something to consider. Um, ventilated head walls, one of the discussions was maybe uh, building, building, building facilities with ventilated head walls and, and use that, that, that laminar airflow to better uh, control infections and, and protect patients and staff. The next group is dealing with emergency departments and in particular waiting rooms and designing them so that they can have uh, separate entrances or completely separated areas within the ER that uh, can be dedicated to patients that are infectious and, and patients that are not. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on, but things to consider is, you know, the redundancy that is needed within the units um, so that you can avoid having to go from a infectious unit, if you will, to a, to a non-infectious unit. Um, these things are naturally very challenging when the, when the ERs are overcrowded like they became. Um, triage areas uh, are, are challenging if you have to bring infectious patients into the building to do triage. So considering doing triage in areas not in the building. And then of course, a lot of uh, use of portable equipment and storage for protective, uh, personal protective equipment and wheelchairs. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about this one later on. And then the last grouping uh, we talked about was uh, figuring out ways to streamline working with other jurisdictions during these, during these events, um, having in place procedures for dealing with uh, public health licensing, for dealing with local fire department and local building department, for you know, having these temporary structures that, are, that may be modular or, or tent structures that can be put up in a moment's notice without going through all of the different uh, permission processes that is required for these temporary structures. So having a, a checklist, if you will, of the things to do in advance of that is what this last group is focusing on. Excuse me. So what I'm going to talk about now is, you know, dealing with the operational changes that, that COVID forced uh, healthcare facilities to embrace. And the idea being here is, you know, we'll talk about some of the things that were done that were very innovative, that were very thought provoking and, and really great uh, ideas that we can carry forward in design of healthcare facilities um, for new facilities or, or remodels of existing facilities. The goal of course being to, to isolate and treat infectious patients 
while being able to continue to provide the other services of the hospital. Bearing in mind that, um, you know, one of the things I learned here is that infection control protocols are designed to protect patients. But in a, in a pandemic like we're experiencing, we need to be able to protect everyone. And so therein lies the, the challenge. Um, some of the things that, that were innovative things that people did was, of course, triage and check-in patients remotely. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, quarantining in, a, in separate facilities to reduce physical contact to caregivers. Uh, and then not the least of which, right now, planning for resurgences of the virus and not only resurgences of coronavirus, but planning for other potential outbreaks from other infectious diseases going forward into the future. Plan now so that we can not be caught short like we did, like we were this past year. So making patients intake safer, that being the first little challenge, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different innovation that came out of this. Uh, tents were the first thing that you saw. The, the, the isolation tents or, or the surge tents popped up all over the place and they were pretty effective unless they weren't. You know, facilities that had weather, facilities that had high wind had really, really big problems with the tents. And that prompted actual hard wall construction like you see in the, the bottom two pictures on the left. Um, and this, of course, this work, of course, had to happen very quickly. If you look at those walls, they clearly aren't, you know, hospital grade construction. They're not fire resistance rated walls and so on. So uh, making these, these rooms or these areas safe and, and functional was part of, the, part of the challenges that facilities had to deal with. Um, so what, what, do I, what do I take away from that for future? You know, future designs need to take these things into account, maybe having dedicated areas for temporary structures already predefined and, and pre-designated. Um, when you have these modular constructs uh, that can be readily uh, disassembled and stored, make sure that they're pre-wired and pre-plumbed and that the spaces that they're gonna be constructed will accommodate them and that they're adjacent to emergency departments so that perhaps they can be con quickly constructed and then become actual indoor spaces immediately connected to the ED. Things to consider. Um, the, as the numbers began to rise with affected, infected patients, uh, the, the next thing that facilities learned pretty quickly was it's probably pretty smart to have different entry portals for different folks. So infected patients could enter from one entrance where non-infected patients or staff could enter from a, a different location. Um, these portals obviously being a great idea, but they require good, note, good uh, signage. You know, they have to be obvious and, and visible so that people don't go into the wrong one inadvertently. Um, the entry portals, the separate entry portals facilitated screening areas uh, that were adjacent to the hospitals that allowed patients and, and staff to be able to deal with these uh, folks very readily and not be separate from the hospitals. And then later on, they of course needed to accommodate supplies. You know, we needed protective equipment, um, patient screening abilities and information capabilities. Uh, they were used for rapid testing. They were used for storage of uh, wheelchairs and et cetera. All of these things were taken, were accommodated and put into place and things that we can then carry forward and, and learn lessons from. Uh, new designs might want to include those areas for supplies, for, for PPE, for wheelchairs, uh, have hand washing stations near these entrances, create negative pressure capabilities uh, at these entrances use technologies at these entrances to strengthen diagnostic and enhance security for patients and, and staff. Those technologies might be, you know, the cameras that, that can detect temperature um, and, and fever in, pati in patients or staff, et cetera. One of the things that was done at Cedars as well as other facilities was using technology and, and using a, 
a, a digital check-in. The this pandemic certainly forced facilities to make better use of tel better use of telehealth, and telehealth isn't anything new. It's been something that we've been doing for a while, and it certainly forces us to to use it better, to use it differently, and to use it better. One of the things that was done uh, using telehealth was the ability to uh, determine the infectious potential of, of a patient and perhaps even give them differing designations. You know, if they're known to be COVID positive, have a red designation, if they, if they might be a yellow designation, if they're not COVID positive, a green designation. And then we can use things like GPS and, and GIS to follow the travel of the patients, have them know when they arrive, direct them to the correct entrance, have staff available to meet them when they arrive and to be able to uh, take high-risk patients directly into predetermined locations rather than having them wait in waiting rooms or, or walking through the facilities. Um, and then of course, telehealth was used dramatically for, for pre-admittance components of, of, of the process. So the, I'll talk a little bit more about telehealth towards the end of the presentation and ways that we can bolster this and carry it forward, carry the lessons learned forward. Now emergency departments, they of course were inundated and they were the ones that um, got overwhelmed almost immediately. One of the things we, of course, learned was that traditional emergency departments were not designed to accommodate pandemics. Um, they, they have common waiting rooms where a bunch of people that are sick come in and sit next to each other. Uh, no real way to seg segregate sick pe people from uh, healthy people. Um, the EDs are, were not self-contained uh, and patients had to be transported from the ED to other, portion, other parts of the facility for x-ray or CT or, or, or other procedures. Um, so these are some of the things that, to take, that we wanna take into consideration moving forward. Uh, having dedicated isolation rooms and decon rooms that are designed into the facility that can of course be used for patients with infectious diseases, but can also be used for behavioral health patients or hazmat contamination patients in the, in the future and not during, uh, during the virus or during the pandemic, excuse me. One of the ways that our group, uh, our little task force is looking at emergency department observation or, or, or suggestions is, is what, kind of what you see here where over on the left where you see area A having all, everybody that comes to the facility start there. You know, everybody that's ambulatory that walks in, they, they come into that space there. And then an immediate determination is made whether they're infectious or not. Infectious patients go follow route B and come in a different, come into the ED through a different portal where patients that are not infectious follow route C and go into the emergency department in a, in a separate portal. The, Emergency department itself is physically segregated. Uh, that can either be done with temporary walls or be done with uh, air HVAC balancing and, and systems. Uh, but the idea being that the infectious patients stay in the infectious area and the non-infectious patients stay in the areas that are not infectious. This includes ambulance uh, entrances. So the ambulances would have two entry portal, portals uh, for the differing patients as well. Now, some of the actions that were, that, that occurred because of the pandemic that hospitals had to contend with um, were, were pausing, you know, normal operations. So regular patient treatment, elective surgeries, uh, normal operations got put on hold so that, so that facilities could accommodate uh, and make more room for patient surge. Um, the increased number of beds within the hospital proper was uh, quite challenging and the use of various different spaces that were probably not intended for patient care were, were really uh, 
utilized a lot, shell spaces, uh, doubling up patients or tripling up patients in patient rooms. In the non -hosp in a hospital setting, but in non-hospital related locations, um, some patients were moved to decommissioned SPC1 buildings, which was, which was okay because those buildings or those spaces may have been um, already configured for patient care, but all of the equipment had been cannibalized, you know, and this, and this took some time and some money to get the equipment back into the spaces so that they could be used for healthcare. Um, there were a few hospitals that had been closed that were reopened to be able to facilitate patients. And then of course, you, uh, within the hospital walls, auditoriums, conference rooms, uh, every area space that you can think of was repurposed and used for surge space. In non-hospital settings though, there, there were these alternate care sites, places like the LA Coliseum and, and other big venues that were reconfigured to be able to accommodate patients. Uh, the governor tasked Oshpod with providing 50,000 patient beds in non-hospital settings throughout the state to, to be able to deal with this. Um, and while that was a challenge, of course, it took one to two months sometimes to get these facilities uh, configured and up and operational and very, very costly, 10 to $20 million in some cases to get these facilities, these alternate care sites operational. Um, and so one of the takeaways, of course, from that was it's, it's always more desirable to keep patients in patient facilities, in the hospitals if possible, uh, even if that means doubling or tripling up the beds. Because in the hospitals, we have the doctors, we have the nurses, we have the systems in place, uh, we have the supplies, all of those things that make healthcare and patient care possible. And trying to uh, duplicate those things in a non-hospital setting when the supply chain is already tasked uh, proved to be pretty, pretty challenging. Um, so carrying that forward, you know, aggregating patients into one site or one part of the hospital, this became a pretty, uh, a pretty common practice. This was not always easy to do. You know, constructing this was not really easy, and sometimes traversing these spaces was not easy to do. Um, and you see on the left the, the uh, fabric wall zipper door that created a, a, a COVID wing in a facility, um, or a, the top right, a, a, a pyro, excuse me, a COVID pod that was created on an outlying building. These things were all put into place and were, were very functional and helpful, but also it's very important that staff understand the, the distinctions between these two spaces, the protocols for the separations, and, and making sure that they don't cross those barriers uh, inadvertently uh, without taking, without donning and doffing protective equipment. At Cedar sinai one of the very first things that our uh, engineering teams were tasked with was providing visual capabilities from the corridors into the patient rooms. This was, uh, this was requested by nursing staff to be able to check on the patient without having to enter the room. Um, this, you can see the before and after, the, the, our engineering staff got very creative uh, with the zipper doors and created a little view panel within those doors. The corridor door is still there, uh, and if need be, it can be closed uh, from a fire protection standpoint. But the, the picture on the right, the after, was we spent, we took about 200 doors within the facilities and during an emergency project process installed these view panels that you can see. Um, th this was really helpful to the nurses, not only from the standpoint of being able to see the patients, but also it saved the amount of time, it, it increased the amount of time they could spend with patients because they wouldn't necessarily have to don PPE, go in and check the patient, and then doff PPE before moving on to the next patient. And of course, indirectly it saved on the cost of those uh, respirators and, and masks and other supplies. Now, carrying this forward, 
this is, uh, and we were very, very lucky at Cedar sinai because one of the medical centers that is under is in design, the, the Marina del Rey Hospital, is at a point where we can incorporate some of these lessons learned. And looking at different options and different solutions, uh, creating, for instance, perhaps hospital, a portion of the hospital that's dedicated to infectious patients or dedicated to pandemic patients. Um, and if you can, if you can do that uh, now during design, uh, that's obviously the best and desirable way to do this. Um, next challenge, uh, a lot of the facilities felt the need to convert certain rooms to negative pressure rooms. This was, this proved to be quite challenging and the hospital engineering staff was, some got extremely innovative in their, in their ways of doing things. Um, you can see that on the right, the, the fans that uh, create the negative pressure room and uh, direct the exhaust to a window. This is something of course to be um, aware of. What, what does that window discharge to? Uh, we do have one example where the exhaust was, was all uh, grouped together and discharged into an elevator lobby probably not the best choice for that particular one. Um, but you know, these are things that the staff have to do very, very quickly and, 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 and it's oftentimes not very easy. Um, things need to be taken into consideration. What is that space where that duct is running across the floor? Is that a corridor? Is that a neat means of egress? So a lot of things to be taken into consideration above and beyond the, the negative pressure areas. Um, some facilities engineers got very creative. And in this particular one, the entire emergency department was converted to negative pressure and 100% exhaust. This was done uh, as an emergency project with Oshpod and happened very, very quickly. And it had to happen very, very quickly because the staff uh, in this particular facility were extremely uh, scared. They were very uh, afraid of the virus and said to the administration, we're just not gonna to come to work. And so this was, the, the administration went to the, the chief engineer and said, we need to do something right away. And this is what he was able to come up with. Very innovative, very good thinking. Um, and maybe a bit over the top, maybe a bit of an overkill, but, but you, know, you have to do what you had to do. And it was, it was pretty forward thinking. Other facilities do things a little a little more simple. Uh, this facility on the right built an anteroom, a negative pressure uh, anteroom, just taped it onto the outside of the existing patient room. That's great if you have the space to do that, but if this was, uh, you know, if this room opened into a, a regular corridor, that might not be an option. Uh, a couple of other choices that, that suddenly became uh, available on the market were these negative pressure isolation rooms you see on the left, or rooms that could be used in the alternate care sites uh, where you have these negative pressure capabilities that might occur inside of a tent. A lot of innovation, a lot of things that went into place. What do we take now from all of this going forward? Well, of course, the first one is during design of a facility, really, needs, really need to consider increasing the number of uh, airborne infection isolation rooms. Sorry, getting a little dry. Um, and, you know, building in options to convert regular patient rooms to negative pressure isolation rooms with the flip of a switch is, is certainly something that a sophisticated building management system can do. Now, that all sounds wonderful, and um, there, and that might be an opportunity, or it might be an option. But it go, but there are a lot of underlying uh, things to take into consideration when doing that. Um, when there are pressure, when there are isolation or pressure differentials, there are usually alarms that go along with that to alert people when those pressure, when those required pressure differentials change when they're not there. Um, 
those alarms, if I were going from positive to negative or from neutral to negative, would need to be switchable so that when those when those relationship changes, the alarms can change with them. Um, a lot of consideration uh, is being given to designing HVA system, HVAC systems to be able to switch to 100% outside air and 100% exhaust. Um, this has certain value as as far as being you know not recirculating the the, the air within the within the building, um, and then also in emergency departments or in waiting rooms in emergency departments, the ability to do purge mode, if you will, or ch convert it to 100% exhaust um, while being able to validate airflow patterns because doing all this work if it is uh, kind of useless if the airflow patterns get altered in such a way that you're moving air in a direction that you didn't intend to. At the Marina Doray Hospital, uh, we're looking at the bigger picture. You know, the emergency department is is on the left where you see the, the various different colored arrows. And in those arrows, those would be where different uh, entry portals are located. But we've also looked at the, the actual flow of uh, the entire facility and, and vehicle arrivals and the, uh, the predefined areas for self-diagnosed patients and for, for triage outside of the building. So, you know, big ticket things that need to be considered in planning these facilities. Um, and we were very lucky to be able to be in a design place where we could actually do these things. Even down to the point where we're identifying operating rooms that would be dedicated for infectious patients. Um, and with that comes the, you know, the route of travel, which elevator does that patient get transported in? Uh, what, how do they go from pre-op to post-op and et, et cetera? All these things are things that we can, we can do now in design and things that you want to consider in the future design. Now, real quickly, um, just want to talk for a minute about PIN4 and how PIN4 got related to, to COVID during this past year. If you're not familiar with PIN4, um, this was drafted back in 1996 when Oshpod, when the state of California was dealing with tuberculosis patients um, to be able to accommodate TB patients in areas that weren't originally designed for TB patients to be located. Um, as this disease got more controlled, 10-4 was, was dusted off and used again during the, the Ebola scares, the H1N1 scares and, and SARS epidemics um, to put in, into practice these same abilities to do very quick, temporary, or even permanent airborne isolation rooms. Um, the takeaway I wanted to, to make everybody aware of as it relates to PIN4 was you know, right in the policy intent notice, it says portable, high efficiency uh, HEPA filtration units that are not hardwired uh, hard plumbed or structurally affixed to floors, windows, or ceilings uh, that are exhausted through windows either directly by installation in the window or by flexible duct through a fixed window panel will not be reviewed by Oshpot. This is kind of interesting. So much of the photos that you've seen, that work that was done during the pandemic, uh, does not require a permit from Oshpod. Now, as it relates to COVID, the Oshpa got a little, uh, drug that in a little bit and basically said, you can do all of this work following the PIN4 variables um, on an emergency basis, as long as the project is both temporary and in direct response to the COVID uh, patient surge. Um, doing this work for, for non-pandemic related uh, activities wasn't wasn't included in this, and um, Ashbad worked with uh, licensing to uh, come up with acceptable practices and and ways of achieving these things without requiring regular construction projects. So that was um, quite the quite the quite the do for the for Ashbad to to take that into consideration. Um, in the blue across the bottom, you see there's a bunch of additional criteria relating to the negative bear balances in PIN4. So there's a lot more to that. I just took these one, 
these two little excerpts from it. Some other interesting things that, uh, some very innovative things that were done um, as lessons learned to limit the infection spread was um, UV treatment of rooms or coils and filters of HVAC systems. Um, we learned that increasing the relative humidity actually uh, limits the transmission range of the droplets from coughs or sneezes of infectious patients. Obviously enhancing the filtration, uh, bumping up to a MERV 13 or 14 is, is, is a, a way to go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also taking into some things to consider is increasing the outdoor air rates uh, to affect some dilution uh, factors into the, into the, into the mix. Uh, we've seen some in-room HEPA recirculating systems that seem to have some, uh, some merit. And then the last point here is maybe we wanna evaluate the minimum total air changes per hour that's uh, specified in the code where we can find that more air changes per hour really reduce the, the, the quanta, which is you know, the, the, the measurement of infectious droplets within the space. Um, another consideration, increased locations where there is low uh, return or exhaust grills, using that laminar airflow process to force uh, infectious rooms or infectious diseases to kind of flow downward in a downward direction. And increasing air changes per hour in toilet rooms, maybe as much as 15 air changes per hour. Um, apparently in China, they were able to track a lot of the infections to, uh, to toilets and to, um, to, to sewer connections and dried traps that were uh, letting sewer gases re-enter spaces. Um, things to think about, lessons learned. Next thing I wanna chat a little bit about medical gas systems. We learned a lot uh, uh, about pandemics and medical gas systems. The first of which of course was uh, that we didn't have nearly enough ventilators. And through a, a, a huge uh, innovation of manufacturers and, and other parties th that, that was solved fairly early in, in the pandemic. And currently there are quite a few available ventilators. That's why that particular item is uh, grayed out. But with the uh, increased number of ventilators, there's obviously an increased uh, flow of medical gas, uh, uh, suction, electrical power capabilities in the, in the rooms where the ventilators are used. And those need to obviously be designed in advance and put in place before the massive patient surge actually comes into, into fruition. Um, we want to rethink the diversity factors for the demand considerations for medical gas. Um, <clears throat> can I can I just change? Is the pipe size adequate? Is the is the is the cap capacity adequate? Um, can the piping capacity be increased? Can I do that just by increasing the pressure within the pipe? What can the pipe withstand that increase in pressure? What's the maximum safe level, et cetera, et cetera? All things to take into consideration when these increased demands for medical gas present themselves like they did in the pandemics. Uh, of course, one of the byproducts of increased liquid oxygen flow is the vaporizer's inability to work and uh, facilitate the phase shift of liquid oxygen from a liquid to a gas. And this became very problematic and prompted Oshbod to issue like this best practice you see over on the left. Um, and they recommended doing things like uh, water sprays or, or fans that, are, that help to keep the vaporizers, vaporizers warm. Not both at the same time, please. We did see some facilities that put fans and water spray <laughs> both at the same time. Um, so not the best. One of the things that we did at, at Cedar sinai is we had, as luck would have it, uh, multiple vaporizers. And with, a, with an automated 
vaporizer switchover valve, we could use one vaporizer um, for a period of time and then switch over to the other vaporizer, allowing it the, the previous one to, to thaw and, and keep switching them back and forth so that we didn't experience this, this freezing like some facilities did. Uh, we also have a, an emergency liquid oxygen uh, trailer that we have and put in place, although never really found a need to use it. We did uh, loan this to facilities here in Southern California that were having the icing problem. So that was kind of cool. Now the next slide has nothing to do with construction, but I found this to be uh, on the forefront here at Cedar sinai something I've never been exposed to before at Oshpot. And I, I saw this firsthand in a lot of different uh, a lot of different instances. My best friend's wife works here at Cedar. She's an ICU nurse, and I saw and then talking to her, uh, I saw this firsthand. You know the the mental health impacts on healthcare workers. Uh, they they were afraid to go home. You know there were doctors who said, you know, my my goal is to not get sick and to not get my family sick, and I failed on both cases. I got sick and I got my family sick. Um, you know being on constant lockdown is is always challenging. No one wants to be around them because the nurses and the doctors represent COVID. You know to the to to family and friends around them. Uh, they're constantly anxious about catching the disease. Uh, to the point where, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, evident. And, you know, I, I've heard people, I've heard, you know, Sonia told me people just think I'm not tough enough to, to do this job. So uh, celebrate those patients, or excuse me, those staff. You know, one of the things that we did a lot at Cedars was to take care of the staff. If this isn't construction related, obviously, but taking care of the people is, is a, a very critical part of this uh, whole process. So I'm gonna wind down with some last uh, other innovations, some things that, that we did and things that I saw that were done at other facilities using technology, because you guys that know me know I'm all about technology. Um, radio frequency ID tags were used for a lot of different things. And some of them were, were, I keep saying the word innovative, some of them were extremely innovative. I mean, we can obviously use the, R the RFID tags to track assets, not just on a room, uh, room or wing basis, but even on a shelf location to know how much equipment is available and where it physically is located. But then expanding that, not just to equipment, but tracking staff, or tracking patients and tr not only doing tracking, but doing tracing so that uh, we, can, we, can we can track the spread of the infectious diseases and know who came into contact with patients that uh, were infectious that maybe weren't um, thought to be infectious when, the, when they came in. Um, these RFID systems can be used to uh, sound alarms. And in fact, some of these did. They, there were hand washing alarms associated with the RFID so that if the doctor came into the room and didn't wash his hands, there was an alarm sounded. If they tried to leave the, 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 the wing or, or the designated COVID area and didn't wash their hands or didn't take off their PPE, they, there would be an alarm that would sound. Um, just kind of innovative ways to to use this technology. Of course, there were a, a lot of touchless operational opportunities too, you know, water fountains, water bottle refills that are, that are touchless, uh, revolving doors, elevators. As you approach the elevator, you don't push a button, the elevator just sees that you're there and calls the car. Um, providing regular swinging doors that don't require hand contact, you know, where, wherever possible. Uh, providing disinfectant mats at entries so that we're not tracking stuff in from the outside. Uh, Cedar sinai is a teaching hospital and so doing rounds with the doctor for with all of the uh, medical students is challenging of course. If you have 10 people going into a room with a COVID patient that's problematic. So during vir doing virtual rounds where 
the doctors in the room and the others are connected by a video conferencing system outside of the area. <clears throat> uh, you can see the picture on the on the top the on the the top here where the the doctor is inside of the room with a con, with an infectious patient and writes down the things that they need or the things that they want and then using you know this this state of the art phone camera <laughs> the the nurse can take a picture of it and then be able to transmit that information where as needed uh, you know a, a very simple rudimentary solution um, Keeping storage, keeping critical uh, equipment like IVs and crash carts and stuff outside of the rooms or outside of the areas so that the nurses can uh, have immediate access to it without having to go into the patient uh, areas is a solution or something to think about. Although the, us fire marshals in the room really don't care for all the storage in the corridors. So you know, be, be cognizant of that, be aware of that. Um, I love robots, so the use of telehealth, uh, computerized robots to do telehealth visits to patient rooms uh, was, was a, a, a real success. Not only does it give the doctor the ability to do more frequent visits because they don't have to uh, don PPE when they enter and don PPE when they leave, uh, the, the robot itself doesn't necessarily need to be decontaminated either. So they not only get to see more patients, but they get to spend more time with the patients. Um, robots that are the, the mechanized helpers, if you will, that, that can pick up uh, equipment and deliver medications and supplies to the patient rooms so that uh, nursing staff aren't um, required to go into the rooms and they're free to do, take care, do actual direct patient care uh, activities. Talked about telehealth earlier, you know, use, I think the future needs to incorporate and uh, facilitate a broader telehealth model. Um, using technology and, and the use of technology will be, the, will be the driver, but it needs to be accommodated in the building design um, to to apply telehealth strategically, uh, making use of augmented reality. Augmented reality is uh, uh, a heads up display on a computer model, uh, excuse me, a computer monitor that gives uh, a telehealth doctor real time patient record information about that patient right in front of them as they're talking to the patient. Um, artificial intelligence and virtual reality. Virtual reality has been being used since the early 90s for. Uh, patient care for pain control, uh, an anxiety, education, exposure therapy, uh, et cetera. But in the role of telehealth, it can be used obviously for uh, teleassessing, uh, diagnosis, telemonitoring, uh, et cetera. Uh, precision, med precision medicine. This is, you know, use optimizing efficiency and, and the therapeutic benefit of, of the medicine based on uh, genetic or molecular profiling so that we can make, so that the medications and the pharmaceuticals can be very, uh, very titrated to the individual person. Um, all of these things I think are the future of telehealth and these long-term strategies as we design the facilities need to incorporate telehealth centers where, where the telemedicine can be coordinated, uh, where there are dedicated telemedicine rooms with privacy, soundproofing, uh, good speech quality, uh, adequate lighting, a robust IT capability for video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these, these are, this is the future of healthcare and needs to be incorporated into today's design. Mind you, this doesn't necessarily have to be in a hospital building. These telehealth facilities obviously can be constructed in non-hospital buildings, and it may be uh, cheaper to do so. So in winding down, what did you take from all of this? Uh, there was a survey done by the American College of Healthcare Architects last spring that asked, how will the COVID-19 pandemic impact the design and construction of healthcare facilities in the future? 
And the survey results were 82% said, we'll, we will need more accommodations for telehealth. Big surprise. Uh, we will need to build more surge capacity into the infrastructure. Also a big surprise. We will need to have more intensive care units and more negative pressure isolation capabilities in the hospital buildings. Um, so these top three are, are the things that we obviously discovered firsthand uh, and maybe should have known all along, but never really incorporated it into, into today's design. We had some opportunity to, to learn these things um, during the SARS and H1N1 uh, pandemic, not pandemics, but epidemics. Um, and we never really followed up on them in, from a standpoint of design, uh, code, et cetera. So that's what I have to talk about. That's my presentation for tonight. Uh, are there any, I just wanna open it up now, any questions uh, or any answers? Answers would be better. Um, I've got a couple questions for you, Gary. Thanks, an informative uh, presentation. Um, so my, the two questions are on the slide where you showed kind of the portable HEPA filtration being routed to a window. Uh -huh. Did you see instances where there were portable, kind of a mock negative pressure room where the HEPA filter was used where you couldn't take it to the outside and you were in effect scrubbing the room to the number of air changes required by a airborne infection isolation. So that's first question. And the second, on the robot, you know, that's going in and out instead of the human, are we assuming they're not cross-contaminating and going into the next room because it's all in one kind of contamination wing or something? Yeah, great questions. And so for the so for the first one. Um, there was a there was a slide later that talked about um, in room recirculating HEPA systems, right. and and those were actually utilized and and were found to be pretty effective. Um, they don't create negative pressure, obviously, right. because right. they're just recirculating the air within the room. So unless you're moving air from one place to another, and in the case that you, you the example you gave, you know, through the duct on the floor to the window, you you won't be able to create those negative relationships short of changing the air balance somehow. Um, so those are obviously the challenges. But, you're, and, but aren't you in effect scrubbing the air of COVID uh, viral particles by allowing the air to pass through the HEPA filter? Absolutely, but it's not creating a negative balance. Oh, okay, right, right, right. It's not negative okay. in relationship to surrounding areas. Yeah, yeah. mock negative pressure, yeah. Um, but it might, but you know, part part of this is psychological, both from the you know patient care standpoint and the staff standpoint. You know, we 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 saw that firsthand that the that the psyche and the psychology to the staff is just as important. They're cer certainly not to be discon discon uh, un whatever the word is I'm looking for here <laughs> discounted. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, and regarding the the uh, the robot. Um, I actually had a little note on my screen that says sometimes the, the robots will need to be decontaminated. But if they're, if like you indicated, if, if it's a COVID wing and they're going from room to room to room within a COVID wing um, and they're not touching anything, obviously they don't come into contact with anything within the room and hoping that the, the patients don't sneeze or cough on the robot, um, there, there should be minimal cross-contamination. Hi, Gary. Tom Clark with Haynes and Oakley. Long time no see. Yeah, it's been a little while. Although you? we've been overlapping at uh, Cedars on some of that COVID work. Um, yeah. A couple of general questions. Um, you know, with, as far as PIN4, you know, I think it's a lot of our experience. We found that um, um, although there were a lot of temporary measures put in place, um, and they were all directly patient surge. We still had a lot of conflict with the uh, field staff. And I know you're not in the official OSHPOD capacity, but I think we found that maybe the path of least resistance without somebody like you on staff um, was to permit that work. And PIN4 was never really updated for COVID-19, was it? it? It was not, but it was, 
if you go to the Oshpod website and uh, look at their, their COVID information, they referenced it directly and, okay. and made it available so that it could be utilized for, for COVID response. As an um, interpretation of that non work did not have to be permitted as long as it was temporary. Right, right. Okay. And, and then, if okay. I might, one more question you had, uh, you know, we talk about and we've been talking about for years about switchable pressure environments for patient rooms. And, you know, it's, it seems to have been a huge stumbling block. Is there progress being made that you're aware of as far as codifying switchable environments? That, that's exactly what this emergency design task force is tasked with. As luck okay. would have it, I got, I got sucked into being the chair for that particular group. Great. So, yeah, that's where we're headed. That we're, we're going to be looking really hard at that um, and, and coming up with, you know, a checklist of criteria. It won't just be a matter of, you know, going to the, going to the computer of the BMS and saying, okay, now you're positive, you know, <clears throat> so there, there will need to be some, some safeguards put into place. Uh, sure. Just, just like uh, negative operating rooms while uh, on the surface might sound smart, there's still that human factor, you know, and if, and if there's not some automation or, or, or some safeguards put into place so that, you know, it gets switched to negative and then they forget to put it back to positive for the next patient that comes into the OR, those are the, those are the considerations that we want to take into account uh, putting together this guideline. Thank you, Gary. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you. Hey, Gary, there are two questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is uh, about the PIN4. Uh, was the 180-day definition of temporary waived or extended for COVID? For COVID, it was extended, and the, the extension was uh, during the entire time of the, uh, of the um, emergency declaration. So until such time that the governor declares that there is no longer an emergency, uh, and of course CDPH has their all facilities letter, has an ex expiration date, you know, the two of them are sort of go hand in hand. Uh, it's not, the 180 days doesn't apply. Okay, thanks. And there's another one about the RFIs. Uh, do RFI system, or maybe I'm wrong, RFID system, sorry, require an in, uh, infrastructure improvement uh, like a DAS, distributed um, uh, Athena system? Yeah, the RFID requires uh, RFID readers uh, and those wouldn't be, those would be located throughout, throughout the floor, throughout the, throughout the areas where they're used. Um, <clears throat> Some of the RFID re some of the RFID readers are pretty sophisticated and can read through walls and and larger areas than you would expect. Um, but yeah, it does require. That's that's why this whole uh, that whole aspect of it is a design consideration and a and a future uh, consideration for better ways of tracking assets and people and patients. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat, unless anybody. I have a question. Um, what happens when your emergency project, like the kind of project that gets installed before it's fully designed, maybe kind of the need for it um, passes before it's, permitted because you follow up the project with documents, right? How mm -hmm. does that work when it comes down to like testing and inspections and things like that? Does it yeah. all just get waived? Well, de definitely maybe. <laughs> How's that for, for a, a governmental answer? Um, yeah, it sounds very, very on point. <laughs> yeah, the, it, of course it depends. It depends on what the project is. Uh, the, if you look, if you recall the that slide that had the photo of the ducks running across the uh, the roof to the exhaust fan on the ground, all that work was done, um, and then Oshbach came out and discovered it, 
and so what, what the heck's going on here? And then we had uh, our mechanical engineer come out and, you know, I created a, a project number for it and it was authorized by Matt Bernard as an emergency project. And we submitted plans. And then before any of that really came to fruition, the facility decided they no longer need it and it was all de demolished and disassembled. So the plan never even got submitted for review so we just canceled the project. Okay. But on some of them where, you know, there actually needs to be, like you mentioned, testing or, or air balancing and, and, and stuff done, all of that gets done prior to design, prior to the plans getting submitted. And, and the only um, risk you take is if something got missed uh, and it gets discovered during plan review, then that might need to be uh, completed after the fact, or there may need to be modifications to whatever was was constructed. Okay, thank you. I'll ask another question, Gary. So this, this talk is related primarily to Oshkosh buildings, hospital, et cetera. Um, are you aware of any um, changes or potential code changes to non Oshkosh regulated medical buildings, specifically, you know, medical office buildings, or for instance, dental offices that potentially aerosolize virus, et cetera? Uh, those. That's a great question, Dave. Those those are not within Oshawa jurisdiction. Right. Uh, right. Clinics would be under would but would be within Oshawa jurisdiction, um, but I, I guess it I guess it should be clear that most of what I talked about tonight aren't necessarily going to be code changes. These are probably going to be best practices, guidelines, uh, uh, good things that are important to consider. But right now, there's not a move really to to change the code to address any of these things, at least immediately. Whether that happens in future uh, variations, uh, I don't know. But for the next code cycle, which is what, 2019, 2021, none of this is being proposed yet. Thank you. Come on, Tom, I know you got more questions. <laughs> I could, but <laughs> I, you know, it, it's been an interesting process because we had a bunch of projects that we thought were under emergency rules and uh, it just was so messy um, that um, we just ended up permitting them. But, you know, what's interesting on those emergency projects, kind of the prior question was, we had some of that, but the work was being done. So we actually had to do mitigation work to put it back to the way it was originally permitted. So, uh, you know, some of them can really get messy. Yeah, what, what I discovered was at, at, in the beginning, nobody knew what was going on. Ashbad, you know, Paul Coleman and Chris and Gordon got together at the time and uh, really put heads together and came up with some forward thinking uh, ideas on how to how to deal with these things, you know, not the least of which is the is the dusting off and and modification to pin four as well as these other emergency projects, but that wasn't really transmitted to the staff very well uh, until later on and eventually, you know, everybody, everybody got the message. Everybody was sort of on the same page. I noticed that the Oshpod website had way more information than the, than the Oshpod field staff knew. Yeah. So um, uh, until such time that that communication gelled, it, it, there were a lot of disconnects like what you're describing. Again, thank you. Great topic. Thanks, Tom. Good to, good to talk to you.
Hey, Gary, it's Mark Payone. How are you? Mark, how's it going? Long time no see. Yeah. Hey, so in, besides the likely uh, code changes to the amount of air changes and pressurization, what, what other code changes do you think we might see? Well, um, like, I, like I said, when I mentioned to Tom, uh, right now, I mean, I, I, can sh I could do a different presentation that shows the proposed code changes. Um, and for all of you that are interested in this, I really, really recommend participating in the hospital building safety board meetings because that's where I currently today get most of my updated information. Um, and I have a, a physical copy of the proposed code changes for the, for the 2021 code, which will be effective in 2022. Um, and right now, pandemic related things aren't in any of the code change proposals. Okay. Now, if you've, if you've written code before, you know, it takes about a year before the code gets published that all of these code changes have to go through uh, a public hearing process, go to the Building Standards Commission and get approved. Um, so I don't anticipate in this, like in this next code cycle, there being any changes that relate to air changes per hour, these pandemic issues. Okay, thank you. There is another question from Mark Enns. Um, from observation, uh, were there areas that Oshpot and CDPH needed to have heart to hearts on? And will uh, we accept, expect uh, the two agencies to grow together in interpretations regarding building response and management response? in future similar instances in any particular areas? Um, well, you guys know me, I'm a consummate optimist, but I really have seen a, a vast improvement in the both communication and relationship between CDBH and Oshbud, um, in, in the, particularly in this last year or two. Um, I'm trying to think of Mark's last name, CDPH supervisors, Mark, uh, I can't think of his last name, it was right on the tip of my tongue, uh, is, attends uh, the hospital building safety board meetings. He attends uh, various different staff meetings. He's really involved uh, in regular dialogue and communication with, with Oshbot. And it's the, that relationship has really improved. Um, now, could are there examples of where that isn't the case, I'm sure there are, you know, uh, and when those when those present themselves or when they become evident, you know, that we, we have a mechanism to fix that as long as we, you know, can be made aware of that. But, but Chris Tokas in particular and Mark, God, I'm almost gonna say his name, I have uh, uh, regular conversations and meetings where, where these sorts of things get dealt with and, and uh, hammered out. Harry, I, I might add that the COVID task force, uh, at least in the committee that I'm on, has about as many, I think actually has more CDHP folks than Oshpot folks, and all the way up to Dr. Bennett. Um, so it, it's definitely a collaboration on, on the design guidelines. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Now's the time to get it right. Well, now it's past the time to get it right. <laughs> Should have got it right back years ago with the, with the other epidemics. Okay. I don't see any more questions on the chat, but do you guys have any more questions? Well, I want to thank everybody, you know, all the, the fam familiar faces and familiar names for those of you that didn't, you know, speak and pop up or put, turn on your video. It's, re 
it's really good to, to communicate with you guys again. I'd love to do more of this with you. Um, you know, one of the things that in my in my role here at Cedar Sinai, you know, I'm sort of the Ashpod facilitator, and I've found that the best way to to achieve success is to make sure that everybody understands the expectations up front. And to 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 achieve that, I like to do a lot of training. And some of the training is um, simple things, you know, like best practices. And some of the things is more, some of the training is more um, down and dirty, like code change, you know, what's new in the code, what's what changed with the mid-cycle code that went into effect in July, what changed, what's being proposed for the next code. Um, and so if you or any of your firms uh, would like for me to do that, obviously, you know, this doing this remote is an option. I love doing it in person, but the remote seems to be the the wave of the current future. Um, let me know because I, I, I would really uh, welcome doing that. Lately, I've probably done training with, I want to say five or six firms on the proper way to submit an application through the e-services portal. And I can do that with, you know, I've done it with people that in the room where there was just two people and people where there was 10 people or, or even more. So if anybody's interested in that, please reach out, let me know, happy to do it. That's great. Actually, that's another the great question. When is the na next webinar with you for the AA Healthcare Committee? <laughs> you would be the one to answer that, wouldn't you? You're the, yeah, you're the master, master of ceremonies. I will reach out to you right after this and we're going to have another one because we all enjoy it and these are just very informative and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I stressed you. about it all day, whether it would, you know, what is, what, you know, what's the, the figuring out the audience is always the challenge, you know, is I don't want to be too basic and I want to be too complex and getting that balance is always is always where I freak out a little bit. So thank you for the, the kind words and, and appreciate it. Of course, thank you. Um, I think we're getting close to 6.30. Um, I don't see any more questions and I think we're good to wrap it up. I wanted to thank you all for joining our healthcare committee again. And thank you, Gary, again, for being here for us. Um, and I would like to let you know that uh, the, those of you who are on my list, you know that Deirdre is our co-chair now. Congratulations and thank you for being there for me. I needed you. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna see a lot of emails from her. And uh, we're going to start our monthly meetings on May 19th. And if you like to join, please email either of us and we're going to put you on the list. And we would love to uh, start again with you guys uh, and like, you know, have a better committee altogether. Uh, thank you so much again. And Deirdre, do you have anything to say? Not today. Looking forward to seeing everyone's faces at the next one. All right. Okay. Thank you. And thanks, Gary, again. My pleasure. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Nilo. Thank you. Thanks,